in the UA, they originally tried to make Kender from the Feywild, which was so lame and stupid and made no sense because Dragonlance has a rich history and lore and they had a really cool explanation. I don't know what the original race was that followed this magical stone that was released into the world. And then, but that race then split into two, becoming, you know, Tinker Gnomes and Kender, right? Both of them very quests for, for knowledge and fulfilling their curiosities, but in very different ways. I don't know if there was originally a gnome or if it was a human or something else. Uh, my, my memory is following me. But it was a really, it, but it's a cool story. So it's like, why are you like bending over backwards to shoehorn this Feywild version in when you already had a cool magical story to begin with. There was no need to do it. They reverted back. They went to their original, got rid of the Feywild, but now it's like all your abilities, you get them because you're magical. I'm Nerdarchist Ted. And I'm Nerdarchist Dave. Welcome, Welcome to Nerdarchy. Nerd for nerds, by nerds. nerds. All right, what do we have on the agenda today? All right, today we're going to look at the player options from 5e, Dragonlance campaign setting slash adventure book has come out. Wizards of Coast was nice enough to send us uh, a box of stuff, which means we're going to put a bunch of that stuff in the giveaway pile. So we have Dragonlance books, regular cover, special cover, and a box set. They're all going to be in the giveaway pile for if you're a patron or you happen to be a uh, subscriber to our newsletter. We randomly draw a name every month and you get stuff from the giveaway pile. All right, so we're going to break down. Like a lot of times in the past we've gone through when we've read all the specific abilities and do our, our way in, but we're going to break this down. We're not going to read through everything. We're just going to kind of give our feedback on what we feel reading through you know, the, these player options. All right, so the section starts off with the races of Kryn, and it just basically goes over the player handbook races and how they kind of correlate and relate to Dragonlance and Kryn and a little bit of their history and how they kind of feel about each other. Yeah. So if you're playing one of the non-standard races, you know, in, in the game, you don't really fit into Dragonlance. Uh, but if you want to play that type of character, they say, like, it's entirely possible you've just come from somewhere else, whether you've fallen through a portal or some other means of planar travel, you can totally play that kind of character. But, you know, you're not going to be an established race in that area. So, you know, be aware of that. Yeah, and then they go into, you know, and they go in, into the other races. And also they got to point out that, like, the... The elves in Kran are a little bit more secluded, so you get a lot less, less half-elves. While they exist, they're just not as common. Right. But we do get the new race, and you know we've, we've talked about this in the UA videos that we've done, but we get the Kender. Yeah, so so the Kender is uniquely Dragonlance, and you know they are one of those races people tend to love or hate, if you're familiar with Dragonlance. Right. They're presented much differently as a race in this book and in the UA, but in previous editions, as well as the novelization, you know, Kenders are eternally, they're eternally curious, and they are basically kleptomaniacs. Like, they don't have a sense of personal property. To them, everything kind of belongs, is communal property, and they're not even aware of what they're doing sometimes, and they just tend to rifle through other people's pockets, and it's part of their curiosity. You know, they're not malicious or evil in their intent. Yeah, they're not They're not trying to, like, oh, I want this, and you've got it kind of thing. It's like, oh, well, I wanted to check that out, and you've pulled it out a number of times, and I never, I've never really got a chance to see it, so I might have picked it up, and then, well, when I was done with it, I didn't really think about putting it back in your bag. I put it into mine. Uh, so it's not it's not that, you know, vindictive or evil or malicious. It's just kind of like they're, they're, some of that halfling aspect of childish nature like stems through into the race. If you were adventuring with a kender and you're looking for something, it's like uh, you're cursing and swearing, I can't find this thing, I knew it was right here. The kender might be like, oh, I found, I found this here, you know, and trying to be helpful, but really, like, the reason you're having a problem is because they took it. Now, so here's a couple things. In the UA, they originally tried to make kender from the Feywild, which was so lame and stupid and made no sense because Dragonlance has a rich history and lore and they had a really cool explanation i don't know what the original race was that followed this magical stone that was released into the world and then but that race then split into two becoming you know tinker gnomes 
and Kender, right? Both of them very quests for for knowledge of fulfilling their curiosities, but in very different ways. I don't know if there was originally a gnome or if it was a human or something else. Uh, my my memory is following me, but it was a really it, but it's a cool story. So it's like, why are you like bending over backwards? to shoehorn this Feywild version in when you already had a cool magical story to begin with. There was no need to do it. They reverted back. They went to their original, got rid of the Feywild, but now it's like all your abilities, you get them because you're magical. Ability-wise, uh, they, they don't have the same sense of fear as everybody else. Uh, you have advantage to either uh, overcome or resist being afraid. You get a skill. It's like stealth, sleight of hand, and I think something else that you can pick from. They're moving in this way where like they're trying to not have anything associated with culture. I have something to say about that. This is exactly where you put the culture stuff. It is a campaign setting, right? It's a specific setting. This is like Kendra don't exist anywhere else. If you move them somewhere else, you could change it. But when you put them in a specific setting, that's where you use the culture. Yes. That's where you would use the physical traits because that's how they evolved right here, right now. We're not talking about Kender anywhere else in the multiverse. Right. We're only talking about Kender here, right? I can kind of get where like, oh, monolithic races make no sense. But in this one case, it is a monolithic race because is, this is the only place that exists. Calm down. I know it's a strong, yeah. strong point. And I, and I feel you, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, but it is one of those things where like, I, I don't understand. Like I feel in order to enrich a world, races need to have culture, but mechanically they're doing yeah. everything that they can to remove culture from the races and it it's mind boggling to just go through this this loop. Like you you need to put rich lore. Lore then associates culture, but you can't tie that culture back to the mechanics of the race and it it's infuriating. Uh, but you know, this video is not about let's just gripe on that. Let's uh let's look at what else we have within player options. But before we finish, I feel mechanically Kender are incredibly weak. If you're playing a very high fear campaign, all right, cool. These guys have advantage on all those checks. And they can automatically succeed once a day. But if you don't, if you're not playing heavily with fear and it's only gonna come up every so often, I feel like, oh wow, they get a skill. That's not a whole lot. Yeah. So, meh. And they also get a taunt ability. Which is kind of cool. Tactically, you could use it fairly well. Tasselhoff Burf often would use it in order to lure away enemies from other squishies. I mean, he's squishy. <laughs> and you're probably playing a Kenda, you're probably going to be squishy. But, you know, if you can get them situated next to your marshals when you do it, that's going to draw attacks of opportunity. And, you know, if they want to go after you or give them disadvantage if they don't, it could be quite useful. It is a little bit light on the abilities, right? In the UA, they had a magical pockets ability. Again, connected to the Feywild, lame, but the the intent was to capture a little, recapture a little bit of the flavor of the original Kenders that were kleptomaniacs uh, and always had different things in their pockets. It was kind of interesting, but I could also see it still causing problems because it had things like gold pieces mm -hmm. that were going to vanish in an hour or so. Right. And that definitely, you know, while there's a lot of fun and flavor that, you know, could be worked, I mean, heck, you could literally lift that up and have that power be a magic item, but it's a scenario where... Or you could just strap it back on the race, right? It, it wouldn't hurt anything. All right. The only thing I might change is be like, I'd be like, remove the magical aspect to it and be like, mm, you just wander around and you acquire things. And, uh, you know, the consequence may not, isn't going to be that those gold pieces disappear, but the owner of them may, uh, may appear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that works, you know, much better. And I don't, and I don't feel that if you strap that on to the race, would they become overpowered in any way, shape or form? You would just have to like warn anyone playing a Kenner, like, look, you've got, you've got this ability. You can do these things. You don't think about where things come from and... At any point in time, I may insert. Or an better NPC. yet, like give them some agency. Be like, how do you think your character generally acquires right. these? And like, you know, they can come up with the modality for their particular Kender mm -hmm. uh, of how they come up with this stuff. You know, and then if you give that caveat of like, okay, well, I'm going to insert an NPC here, you know, that you could have something that belongs to them, you know, and it becomes a, a, a whole thing. Yeah. So next up is we have two major organizations that get introduced. Uh, the Knights of Salamnia and the Mages of High Sorcery. These are kind of pillars of Dragonlance. And, you know, and also, you know, in the 5e Dragonlance book is in addition to all the other original source 
material. Basically, it's just not. Neither of them are what they used to be. Yeah. Right? They are. They are. Mass, they are vastly in decline. But they are very interesting aspects of the world of Dragonlance, and you can also use them to now flavor your characters with them, as well as you know interesting NPCs for your players to interact with. Yeah. Not only do you get to flavor your character, you can literally mechanically choose to be a part of them and gain some interesting and cool abilities. Yeah. They they do have some parallels in the sense that. Both of them have three different sects. So the Knights of Salami have the Knight of the Crown, Knight of the Rose, and Knight of the Sword. Whereas with the 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 Mages of High Sorcery, you've got the Red Robes, the White Robes, and the Black Robes, each associated with a phase of the moon within Dragonlance. And, and also an alignment. <laughs> <laughs> and an alignment, you know, white being positive, red being neutral, and black being evil. If you join an organization within the Mages of High Sorcery, you're really only attributed to one. So like when you choose your initiate feat, uh, you choose what alignment you're associating with, and then you can only step up and take you know, the next thing associated with that. Whereas with the Knights of Salomnia, you can, you can get your scribe and then join any of the three and then move to any of the others. And yeah, it actually makes sense because you start as a squire in Knight of the uh, Knight of the Crown, and so everyone generally would have that one. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have to mechanically, but you would have been affiliated with that one before moving to the Rose or the Sword. But mechanically, you can you can only officially belong to one of the three at any given time. But mechanically, if you've taken all of the other feats, which you're allowed to do, you still retain all of the powers and essentially maneuvers that you can do within those. Whereas, like, you would somehow have to, like, go back to the organization and strip out your your abilities within the Mages of High Sorcery and join a new school. And I, I don't know how it was done in the novels, how Raceland goes from a red robe to a black robe, but I know it happens there. It is kind of a rare instance and frowned upon, but also it was Raceland, and Raceland broke some roles <laughs> and had some help doing them. So it was, it was a bit different. Also, so I guess if you're talking about Towers of High Sorcery, the Mages of High Sorcery, you have to also talk about what exactly that means and renegade wizards. So basically anyone with spellcasting ability can join the Tower of High Sorcery. Uh, Divine is frowned upon, but they it basically says eh, they might fudge the rules if you know if someone you know shows a lot of promise or whatever. Power is power. But it generally is going to be made up of uh, sorcerers, wizards, and warlocks. Obviously, two of those things didn't exist previously, but so they just kind of shoehorned them in. But it still kind of works. Now, when you, you know, it used to be in previous editions at third level to be a mage, you would have to take your test uh, at the Tower of High Sorcery. And if you failed, you died. And even if you succeeded, you might have some bad things happen to you as well. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a small thing. It wasn't without consequence. Now it's kind of like, I think it just kind of happens. But like they do discuss it and talk about it. And it is possible you, you, your DM might decide to have you do it in your game, uh, which be, could, could be kind of like a fun, cool solo thing for the wizard to do. Now, if you do not complete your tests and somehow survive, or if you're just like, mm, I don't like you guys, I don't want to be a part of you, I'm going to wizard anyway, <laughs> well, the they will probably send out wizards to hunt you down and kill you. They do not brook having... Spellcasters, specifically, you know, mages, arcane casters, that are not part of the uh, mages of high sorcery. Yeah, and that that's a lot to you know really play with, and again offers some nice little lore and potential to play with as a PC of like, all right, well, yeah, I'm okay with being hunted. Let's do this. Yeah. Also, the interesting thing too is because you have the three different towers, well, three different orders, I should mm -hmm. say. There used to be five towers, but uh, you know. One of them kind of fell into disrepair and is cursed, and three of them were either destroyed, I believe were destroyed, and there's only one left. That's where everyone takes their test at now, and they kind of, like, consolidated their power. But the interesting thing is, because you have these three different orders, you might not, in a regular D&D &D game, associate with an evil wizard as a NPC that isn't in a, a combat or adversarial role. But here you could because they exist as an order, mm -hmm. um, and, which is also kind of weird. Be like, oh, we have this group of evil people club uh, over here. Don't mind us. <laughs> so mechanically, it's associated with the evil alignment, yeah. but 
from a lore perspective, it's associated with the moon. While there might be the general mm -hmm. connotation, yeah. like it's not necessarily like, okay, let's give you the evil stamp. Uh, only a moon that <laughs> evil people can see. There's that, because the black moon, no one else can see but them. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, but it, it would give you a reason to interact with these evil wizards in a non-confrontational way because maybe you need something or you know you're you're you're, you're working towards the same goal and because they kind of operate in the open for the most part they're accessible knights of salomnia you know are kind of you know just your your knights and they're they're out there to do good in the world as dave says like they're they're definitely on on the decline but you know they have two things they live by right the oath and the measure mm -hmm. and the oath is the oath is simple my honor is my life but the measure is a bit more complicated convoluted it's a very long list of rules that has been added to and changed uh, and like now it could really use a good restreaming and refurbishing but no there's not enough knights to uh vote someone in high ranking enough to actually make those changes so they're kind of stuck until they can recruit more knights and you know and revitalize the order a bit so there's that going on uh, but yeah you know it you they could be quest givers they could be you know they could come to the aid of the players uh, the players could come to their aid. So it, it's going to inter add an interesting dynamic into your game. Organizations are, are a great thing to add into any game, any world. So it's good to see that here is a structure, here's a way to use and build out mechanically some things that actually work within. Now, going from organizations seems to dovetail really nicely into backgrounds because we get two that correspond to those orga organizations. But also there's something different about Dragonlance. Introduces or builds upon what we saw in Strixhaven and that is the uber background, which you, when you take the background, you get a feat mm. at first level and at fourth level. And my biggest, and they fixed the thing that was my biggest beef with Strixhaven was like, well, why would anyone not take one of these right. backgrounds compared to the other ones? Where when Dragonlance goes, no, everybody at first level and fourth level gets an extra feat. But if you happen to be, you know, a a knight or a mage, you're going to be taking these specific feats that you're going to have. There might be some choose, but the choice, but there is not very much. Uh, and for uh, everyone else, there's a list. At first level, you can take tough or skilled, uh, which is nice. I mean, so it also means there's a lot more skill heavy characters in Dragonlance than yeah. other worlds, yeah, so, and they're hardier. So you're either a a knight, a mage of high sorcery. Or the world itself is hardier and and more knowledgeable, and that's just that's just how it goes. You know, when you're looking at these kinds of that, at these kind of campaigns, these kind of characters, and should you decide to look at this structure for your campaign, here's the thing of like, all right, I want to give my players an extra feat at first level, regardless of what, you know, what you're choosing. You now, here is a nice mechanic to to say. Well, it's already being done within the rule set, so why not? So let's look at what they get at fourth level. So at fourth level, you gain another bonus feat of your choice from either the first level list above or the following list. Uh, you can get any of the three adepts, red, red, black, or white. You can get any of the three knights, knight of the crown, rose, or sword. But you can also get alert, divinely favored, mobile, sentinel, or warcaster. And most of those are going to be within the player's handbook, but Divinely Favored is a new one within within that book. So you get some nice options, and if you really like adding feats into your games, you're going to get them. I know a lot of DMs will just give characters a feat at first level, uh, which also means like if you're playing a human, a human character, you're you're really getting a lot of, a lot of feats, especially a human fighter at sixth level. Mm. That's that's a lot of feat. I mean, feats you you normally would get. You know, the two from your levels, then one for human, and then two for dragon. That's five feats at sixth level. That is quite impressive. That's like a 20th level character in another game. <laughs> that is pretty incredible when you look at that, you know, and knowing that they're going to get another eighth and, and more so beyond. You know, so being able to be like, all right, well, I want both stat adjustments and feats. Like, you could really play that kind of stuff up pretty harsh. Yeah, so, so that's fun and interesting. I, I like that idea. I like what they're doing to differentiate Dragonlance from other settings. And like I said, they fixed the problem of Strixhaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree. And I think they saw that after they put it out there that a lot of people are like, what the flip? Uh, yeah. You know, us, us among them. But, you know, when we look at, you know, what else we get within that, we're talking about feats. There's nine feats within, you know, the book itself, obviously. So, like, eight of them are going to be associated with those organizations. You know, the Initiate of High Sorcery and the Squire of, you know, the, the Crown. You know, all those things 
are the the entryways into those organizations, and then obviously divinely favored being the the last. You're going to be a lot more spellcastery if you're a spellcaster, and you go the mage route in in Dragonlance for sure. Because you know all all of their things basically give you some extra casting. And like an extra cool ability that you get to use based on whatever robes you choose, right? You know, if um, you know if you go with white, it tends to be more protective. If you go with red, it tends to be more, I would say, miscellaneous. And if you uh, go with black, it tends to be more aggressive. Uh, aggressive, <laughs> yeah, it would be. Good. And they they also introduce some really cool uh, mechanics for that. Now, all the knight feats, you know, two of the three of them are uh, well, actually, there's four if you count the squire. And, you know, half of them are half feet, so you get a stat adjustment. But in addition to the, that, you also get a couple cool abilities, uh, which a lot of them are, like, buffs in, in, in combat that you can either do to yourself or somebody else. I believe it is Knight of the Sword that allows you to command uh, someone else. So as a reaction, you're like, hey, you can hit somebody. So, you know, anything that gives the rogue another chance to sneak attack. Oh, yeah, know. absolutely. Uh, so a lot of fun feats, you know, with within this thing, you know, built within the organization. You know, it's uh, I'm I'm really happy to see this structure. Uh, I think like I think in the UA there were a couple of them that we were like not happy with, mm -hmm. and they totally fixed it because it was agree. like they they said basically like everyone got battle maneuvers from the battle master, and I was like this is kind of lame and boring. Uh, and un uninteresting, and they they did a good job of fixing that. You know, turn it, turning it away from a maneuver into its its own thing that you can do a certain number of times a day, related to your your proficiency bonus, I think is 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 nice and a nice fix that doesn't be like, oh well, you have to go this route. Now it works well if you want to do this thing and associate it to, you know. I've I've got a a battle master, but if you're not playing a battle master, it forces you to go this direction, and not as cool. It's not as cool, yeah. And and you if you do go with the battle master route, you don't lose anything for right. that. You still have cool, interesting things that you get to do in addition to all your battle master stuff. I would agree. So the last thing within the player options is going to be a new sorcerer subclass, and that is going to be lunar sorcery. Yeah. So the lunar sorcerer kind of draws on the power of the three moons. And I gotta say, this is probably the most versatile sorcerer to be introduced into 5e yet. It's it's incredibly flexible, and for that, I really like the way that that it works out. Uh, you can you can kind of play around with things and actually get a number of free casting of like low level spells, uh, you know, which I kind of dig. So you're gonna get a couple spells that aren't even on the wizard spell list: lesser restoration, as well as death death store. Of course, it depends on what what you pick for your uh for the, the phase of the moon and that's just it you can always choose what phase of the moon you're in to determine which suite of abilities you use uh one of their abilities also lets them get a discount on sorcery points mm -hmm. so they're going to get more bang for their buck when they use sorcery points but it's always for specific schools and it's based on what phase of the moon you're in right and you've got the ability to like it's not like when you finish a long rest as you gain levels you can change what phase of the moon you're in you know like almost like on the on the spur spur of the moment and I'm like, okay, now I'm here, so now like, okay, well, perhaps in this situation I feel like this, and then now as we go into battle, I'm gonna change it to that. So like, you can have a lot of fun with it, and I feel like because of that... But there's a cost, it costs oh, yeah. a sorcery point. Yes, so. yeah. So yeah, and like, we're not gonna go through ability after ability with this, we're just kinda like our top-down overview of it. I really like what, you know, what, what it has. I don't know how exactly this is gonna fit into a non-Dragonlance campaign, but you know, perhaps you can figure out the issue with the with the moon as you kind of go through things. Well, as long as you have a moon, right? right. Like it works. It's not really based. On, I, I maybe I said it was based on the three moons, but I misspoke. It's actually both based on the lunar phases right. of a moon. Mm -hmm. So, so it does doesn't really matter. But hey, you like this video, others like it as well. As well as all the great content you can find over at nerdarchy.com. Why not come check us out on Patreon and support us over there? Articles like "Feel the Fallout of an All Out Dragon War in D and D." Another great way to help out Nerdarchy is to check out Nerdarchy the store. Great products like Seizing the Means. Another dragon flavor product. In Seizing the Means, characters traveling through the wilderness discover an unusual kobold culture. Fed up with being put down by the majority of entities in the multiverse, these creative kobolds have discovered a way to steer the course of their own destiny and evolution. 
This special encounter was created as a free preview for out-of-the-box encounters for 5th edition. Designed in the same style as all 55 gorgeously illustrated encounters in this book from our wildly successful crowdfunding campaign. Seizing the means is ready to drop right into your games. With new monsters, a new skill challenge, and engaging story elements, this easy-to-use scenario will energize your game session. Let us know what you think of 5e Dragonlance. Have they, did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? What do you love? What do you hate? Share your thoughts and ideas with the Nerdarchy community down below. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Go ahead and click on that notification bell. You know the drill. Quick reminder, we drop several new videos a week, so come on back. But you can't wait till then. You can check out that UA we did, Dragonlance 5e Heroes of Kryn Revisited, Unearthed Arcana Review. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.